begin our discussion, debate, and reflection on our topic, I would like to introduce our first keynote speaker, General Paul Selva. General Selva serves as the 10th Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the nation's second highest ranking military officer. General Selva graduated from the U.S. Air Force Academy in 1980 and completed pilot training at Reese Air Force Base in Texas. He has held numerous staff positions and commanded at the squadron, group, wing, and headquarter level. Prior to his current assignment, General Selva was the commander of the U.S. Transportation Command. General Selva is a command pilot with more than 3,100 hours in important aircraft that have supported many who sit in this room today. And those include the C-5, the C-17, the C-141, the KC-10, and the KC-135. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to General Paul Selva. Good morning. Do you mind if I don't stand behind the podium? Awesome. So I, so I have to do a survey. Those of you in the back corners, if you ever lose audio, wave at me. Because I can't hear the speakers. I'm deaf as a post. And when I'm close to a microphone, the magic of high-tech hearing aids shuts down my hearing. So they actually turn off in the presence of speakers. So that means if you have a question for me a little bit later and I'm going to entertain questions, you have to yell at me, which is an unnatural act. But trust me, I will forgive you. So thanks for the opportunity to be here, particularly to the midshipmen who have made time in your schedules to skip class and be here. Um, thanks for your interest in the, in the topics of the day. Um, I am, as many of you know, uh, an advocate for innovation in our services, for real, true, core innovation in how we do the business of warfighting. And I have to describe that to people in industry when I talk about innovation and what I mean about bringing new ways of fighting wars and, and doing the business of battle into our services. So I have to describe our product. And most of them blanch when I use the following description. Our job is to witness unspeakable violence on the enemy. That is what we do. We kill people and break things. Now, when I have a conversation in commercial industry about bringing best practices out of the data integration business or commercial data management businesses, into that concept of modern warfare, they actually ask an awful lot of really hard questions. But let's face it, that's what we do. If you read the history of the most recent war in Iraq very, very carefully, you will find a very short chapter in that history on the maneuver of two Republican Guard divisions. They were coming south to blunt the thunder run into Baghdad. Third or fourth armored division, I forget which, was on its way to Baghdad. And these two Republican Guard divisions thought that they could hide under the cover of an epic dust storm. And so they drove into a plantation, a date plantation, and they neatly parked their tanks inside all of the date ponds and thought they were hidden. And they figured because of the dust storm, the United States military couldn't find them, save two pieces of technology. Our national technical means that orbit the planet and collect intelligence, and the JSTARS aircraft that actually were able to detect the tanks on the plantation and pass target quality data to a whole host of aircraft, Marine, Navy, and Air Force, that decimated those two Republican Guard divisions. Their history ended that night. All of their armor, most of the soldiers, and all of the leadership were killed that night. Legitimate combatants in a discriminate, precise, 
proportional attack to prevent the loss of coalition lives as we made the final move on Baghdad. Rewind the clock almost 100 years. In World War I, weapons were introduced onto the battlefield that witnessed unspeakable violence across that entire battle space. Some of them were viewed through the lens of discriminate, precise, deliberate application of force. Others, through the lens of absolutely indiscriminate weapons designed because they caused human suffering, not because they had operational utility, but because of the human suffering that they imposed on an enemy, they could prevent them from moving freely in the battle space. And so the former we know is the machine gun. High volume rates of fire, industrial age warfare that could kill on a large scale, but didn't cause inordinate suffering and was not indiscriminate because it was purposefully aimed by a human at a human. But the other class of weapons we know is chemical weapons. And what happened right after World War I? Nations got together and developed conventions on the ethical and unethical use of chemical munitions on the modern battlefield. Now that didn't rid us of chemical weapons. You know that because we just saw them used again in Syria just a few weeks ago. But it did, for the most part, limit their use in combat. And that's a huge step for mankind. But I'm a realist. There isn't a single weapon that humans have invented that somebody hasn't used in battle across the entire spectrum of weapons humans have built, somebody has decided to use them in battle. And so when I think about what warfare might look like in 20 or 30 years, with the introduction of modern big data analytics, artificial intelligence, autonomous or semi-autonomous weapon systems, we've got a lot of soul searching to do. Because if we believe the conventions of Western rules are going to drive how those weapons are used in war, I think we're kidding ourselves. And we're not reading history carefully. So we're going to have to figure out how they work, how we can use them to advantage on the battle space, and how we can prevent their indiscriminate use by those who might use them indiscriminately. And that means you've got to figure out how to defend against them. I've used the words the Terminator conundrum in public several times to get people to think about what it is I'm trying to describe. A fully autonomous weapon that can decide when to inflict violence on an opponent. There's several words in that sentence that are really important. Fully autonomous, that can decide on its own when to inflict violence on an opponent. Do we want a world where the T-1000 might exist? Do we want a world where a weapon might come into this room and autonomously select me from this entire audience and take my life without consulting with its human operator. What does that world look like? And I think that's really the window that we have to look through for the next 20 or 30 years. Because while I seriously doubt that we will field that weapon, I have significant doubt that our adversaries aren't already thinking about it. And if they are, 
How do we defend against it? How do we get inside the network that makes it work and stop it from doing its decision process? How do we deny it targets? How do we defeat it? And in the absence of the ability to prevent it from being used in the battle space, we must be ready to defend against it. I will tell you, the sum of the amount of thought that's going into either of those extremes is relatively paltry by my estimation. This is a conversation we should be having in every classroom. It's a conversation we should be having in every strategy session. It's a conversation we ought to be having with national and international leadership to determine the pathway that we think we must take. We have people who are this visionary. 68 years ago, at the close of World War II, when the Soviet Union was ascendant in Eastern Europe, NATO was born. Eleven like-minded countries that wanted to prevent Russia from moving across Europe and controlling large swaths of the European population. It was coupled with the Marshall Plan to, to basically rebuild Europe as a functioning set of democracies. And the combination of those two things prevented the spread of communism across all of Europe. We can be this visionary. We can think ahead of world events. But generally, it requires a crisis. My proposition to you today is we can't wait for the crisis. If we wait for the crisis that will be artificial intelligence and autonomous weapon systems, we may be too late. And so the fact of your coming together today to talk about and think about the ethics of warfare on the future battle space is huge. The fact that we have young midshipmen here soldiers, Marines, and yes, even an airman, that are talking about how we should think about this subject. Not to assert that we have the right answers, but to talk about the value of seeking those answers is an astronomical step forward. So I deeply appreciate you inviting me here to have a chat. This is about having a chat, which means you get to ask me questions and I get to wrestle with the answers. But trust me, these are things we will have to wrestle down the answers together, because there are no easy answers in this space. So with that, thank you so much for the invitation. If you really, really, really can't think of a question, ask me why the cup of coffee's on the podium behind me. That's an easy one, save it for the end. But I am open to your question. Yes, sir. Uh, in your list of uh, three areas we have to worry about, which were big data, AI, and uh, autonomous weapon systems, you left off, it seems to me, one that's not very much talked about, and that's extreme miniaturization, uh, partially because we don't know if we have uh, that already such weapons and that they're under development, although in rather small scales, I think. DARPA throws a lot of little cottage mm -hmm. projects out there. But would you care to uh, speculate about how important extreme miniaturization may be in the future? Yeah, I, I think it is a trend line. Um, what I left several things off the table, by the way, that we could have had a fairly robust conversation about. One is biocybernetics, and the other is nanomaterials. And the two actually come together in some very interesting and intriguing ways. Uh, if you read the article in BBC yesterday about Facebook trying to get to a set of neurosensors that would allow you to mentally control your computer that technology, and I have not talked to Dr. Dugan about the initiative, but knowing enough about how one might do that 
it's going to require both miniaturization and a degree of biocybernetics because you're going to have to put sensors on the surface of a human's scalp to determine the electromagnetic signals that are going on in their brain, and then you teach the computer what those signals mean. And that's how you use your brain to control a computer without doing literally brain surgery. And there is a way to do it. It's horribly complex, but it requires at least those two pieces of technology and a variety of others. But miniaturization, both of potential weapons and of intelligence tools, actually links to the human in some very interesting ways. So uh, I, d I didn't mean, don't mean to belittle either of those uh, because they, they will potentially change the future battle space. The how is the part that really, I, I don't, I'm not smart enough to actually get into the detail of. Uh, what I do worry, though, is that an opponent might engineer a human to make them a weapon in, in ways we ethically would prevent ourselves from doing. And it is humanly possible to genetically and, and psychologically engineer humans in ways today that we couldn't do just a few years ago. And, and those are those are doorways to a very different future that I think we need to deeply think about. Yes, sir. Sir, um, Tom Agee from RBG2, um, also <coughs> escaping the Pentagon today. Um, Good for you. There's two of us. <laughs> um, your comment on the, the Terminator conundrum, I guess for the sake of discussion, I'd like to push back in two ways, one pragmatic, one ethical. Pragmatically, um, Peter Singer commented that when he was researching for Ghost Fleet, that without looking real hard, he found 23 systems currently in our inventory that violate the the human in the loop rule. Ethically, if you can show empirically that the machine, uh, that the algorithm is better at avoiding collateral damage, isn't it unethical to stick to that rule? No, I don't think it is. However, so let me, let me point out a couple of things. One, I would challenge Peter Singer on his assertion that there are no humans in the loop on the systems that he's laid out. Now, I haven't seen the whole list of 20 plus, but in almost every system we have today, and I do this in the JROC all the time, where does the human make the decision to deploy the system? And in almost every case, and actually every case that, that we have looked at as the collected JROC, there is a human choice to deploy a system. But it is true that algorithms are now better than humans at most recognition tasks. That's a proven fact. I mean, you look at Facebook's facial recognition software, Three years ago, it's not, a, it's not a mistake that about three years ago, Facebook rolled out that capability in mass and that Google did the same thing. Because about three years ago, the algorithms for object recognition exceeded human capacity in terms of accurately recognizing objects. In fact, it's so good. I'll give you two examples of, of what you can do if you study the human face. You know, it's nearly impossible now to disguise your face and not be recognized if a single piece of data about you is known. That single piece of data is your interpupillary distance. You can disguise a lot of things. You cannot move your eyeballs. And so in thousands and thousands of test runs and recognizing people that had purposefully tried to disguise themselves, software can determine who you are with a fairly high degree of reliability, simply by measuring the distance between the center of your two pupils. That one was interesting. Here's the one that I found fascinating. In, in Lancet, the British um, uh, Journal of Medicine, there are several articles about a piece of facial recognition software that was used to assist psychiatrists in diagnosing depression. With 80% reliability, the software was able to pick patients who were clinically depressed. Psychiatrists are not that good. So imagine that tool in the hands of a trained psychiatrist who is looking for a person with depression. And, it, and all the software does <laughs> is observe the muscle tissue in your face through your skin 
and determine how you are, how your brain is telling your face to configure itself. That's all it's doing. Right? And so you think about those two things and you go, how did they come to be? Well, they came to be because algorithms that recognize specific things about the human face are now more accurate than humans. And so to your assertion about some weapon systems have an algorithm that decides to attack an object that can do that at astronomically higher reliability rates than humans intervening in the loop is fact. But a human put the system there in the first place. My, my classic one, by the way, since we're in an a audience with naval officers and naval midshipmen, is, is maritime mines. You can build a mine and program it <coughs> to only attack a specific kind of vessel based on its magnetic signature or its acoustic signature. And you can put it out there and say, only attack those ships. Is that an autonomous system? Some of you are going, oh, I'm like, yeah. I go, it is, except it doesn't get there by itself. A human decides to implant it or emplace it. A human decides to turn it on, and a human can decide to turn it off. And so it's really not autonomous. In Peter Singer's uh, lexicon, though, it is. And so that's, that's why I push back a little bit on that assertion. As long as humans are making the decision and humans control the on-off decision, not a completely autonomous system. If you say go, and you turn it loose, and, it, and the system has control of all of that, then it's autonomous. And so, so I think we, we have to decide how we're going to play in that space. It's a tough call. Yes, sir. Where are you from? So I'm from Pennsylvania. Okay. This is the first time I've been It's good to meet you. Uh, so my question is, do you believe that there's criteria that would justify waging a preventive attack against a state organization that would a great question. It, you're really getting, please have a seat. You're getting to the question of preemption. Is it legitimate to preempt when you have a priori knowledge that is, you use the state entity, I'll, I'll just broaden this a little bit, that any entity is going to attempt to attack, in your, in your question using autonomous systems, if I can broaden it a little bit, using any system. We have an aversion to preemption, but let me put it in a different context. Why would we let our force suffer the first blow if we have the capacity through whatever means, big data, pattern recognition, signals intelligence, you pick it, to determine with a reasonable degree of certainty that an adversary is going to attack our fielded force? Why would we allow our force to absorb the first blow? Right now, we do that because we don't have the level of certainty that the attack is imminent. But there are places in the world where that evidence builds very, very quickly. But we haven't, as a general rule, built preemptive weapons. And so I'll give you an example that I worry about a lot. Just north of the DMZ in Korea, there are tens of thousands of artillery pieces and short-range ballistic missiles, which we monitor every single day. If we had compelling evidence that the North Koreans were actually bringing those systems out of their hide sites to attack Seoul, where there are 24 million inhabitants, should we take preemptive action? I think the answer is yes. The question is, do we have the compelling body of evidence that what he's doing is anything different than what he does in every exercise? And so you'd have to have some context around the question. What's going on between us and North Korea? What's going on between the North and the South? Is the movement of those systems a deliberately provocative act? And does it look like he's actually going to shoot? And by the way, there's another criteria. Is there anything we can do about it? 
So have we developed the weapon systems that have the accuracy and the discrimination to actually shoot back inside of a time cycle that matters? Today, the answer is no. We have some, but not enough. They are not designed to do the sort of preemptive attack you and I are talking about. They're actually designed to be reactive and defensive. But if you are truly going to preempt and try to prevent the attack on Seoul, we have to answer with literally tens of thousands of warheads that can hit a distributed set of targets in a relatively hard place to hit. Rugged terrain, hard rock, height sites built all over the place. But assume for the moment you could and you had that system fielded, what decision timeline are you going to be on? Time of flight for an artillery round from the Kaesong Heights to downtown Seoul is about two and a half minutes. And from the time the first one launches to the time the 250,000th one launches is about three hours. Are we going to have a political decision, a military operational decision to preempt inside of a timeline that's somewhere between two minutes and three hours. That command and control system hasn't been built. It hasn't been built. And that's when I talk about artificial intelligence, pattern recognition, cueing and tipping and understanding an enemy's behavior to people that do big data, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Can you empower a decision from the President of the United States, the PACOM commander, or the USFK commander, whoever's been delegated the authority, in something on the order of two minutes based on the enemy's pattern of behavior? If the answer is yes, bring it on. If the answer is no, we got a lot more thinking to do. Way back in the corner, there was a question, and I'll get you right over here. Yes, sir. I'm going to elaborate just a bit on your conception uh, of when uh, a weapon system decides autonomously. That is, if there's an algorithm that structures various sorts of decision paths. And the person who chooses to deploy it is aware of the potential uh, sorts of paths that it could take. One could still argue that it's not really deciding in the way that, say, a human decides. But where along sort of the spectrum <coughs> uh, do you think that ultimately we, we would uh, be in a situation in which there is genuine decision making autonomy? I Again, I don't think we get to genuine decision-making autonomy in weapon systems. <clears throat> That's not the way we're intellectually wired. We have, we have a, we have a built-in ethical bias to humans in the loop. The question is, how, how far back in the process are we going to demand that the human make the decision? Or will we continue to press, as we do today, to put the human at the front end of the decision? Right, at the, at the last possible chance to say no. And we have a spectrum of those capabilities right now. But generally, we bias towards what I call the front end. And, and I think over time, that spectrum is actually going to grow, the distance between human intervention and no human intervention will grow. But I think in, in Western logic, we just have a hard time getting to no human intervention. And when I talk about completely autonomous, the only human decision that gets made is to turn it loose. And every other decision is made by the machine. Now, we're a long way from that being real. Um, I had a long talk with a PhD up at the Cornell Technion Institute. And, and he spent most of his recent adult life, he's not very old, um, studying artificial intelligence. And not how you teach it, but what it might learn you don't want it to know. So I call him the counter AI guy. And, and so his description of AI actually made my hair turn gray and stand up on end. That's <laughs> why I wear this haircut. Uh, he said, we don't under, we, there's more we don't understand about AI than we understand. And so I said, okay, I'm a simple airman. Let's put this in historical context. Are we closer to Charles Lindbergh or Chuck Yeager? He said, we're actually much closer to the Wright brothers in our journey on artificial intelligence. 
part of the reason is what you can learn about artificial intelligence that's intriguing and interesting happens really fast. But his argument was what you will learn about artificial intelligence that's actually useful will take a very long time. And then he caveats this and says a lot of people will get rich along the way with the novelty of artificial intelligence, but the real value of artificial intelligence in replacing human interaction is decades away, decades away. So I think that will, that will also fuel our bias towards keeping humans in the loop toward much closer towards the kinetic end of the fight than the decision end of the fight. I'm going to get one over here, and I'll be right to you, sir. Yes, sir. So Andy Corbett from King's College in London. Um, but back to your, your, your thoughts on, on preemption, the, uh, the process you described, I would say, is, is, is <coughs> and I don't mean to sound, it's linear. It's they do this, therefore we do that to counter that. Is there a place currently inhibited, I would say, by the way we think about warfare generally, for we think they might be able to do this, Therefore, in order to stop them thinking about doing that, we need to be able to do something else. And therefore, we need to have the, uh, the conceptual equipment in place to be able to justify the something else against the, uh, the outcome of what they might be able to do right. should we not be able to counter with preemption. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right on. Um, <clears throat> I personally have a prejudice because I tend to be, I'm an engineer, <clears throat> so I'm a fairly linear thinker. But I also am a subscriber to the, the worldview that says asymmetry actually works, which I think is where, where you're coming into the picture with. Just because A plus B equals C doesn't mean there isn't another way to get to C, and therefore there's a, another way to get to not C. And can we go around the linear path in, in a more effective way to prevent someone from taking an action? I think the answer is yes. I'm just not smart enough to figure that out. So I hope you are. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Sorry, Al, along with Warren College. What are your thoughts on the equipment senior leaders for ethical decision making, given the decision to either develop, deploy, or employ these types of systems? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think we ought to spend a lot of time with senior leaders talking about ethics. Um, not just about ethical decision making, but about ethical leadership and what that means to our force writ large. Um, I've, I've spent a fair amount of time trying to do that. Institutionally, it is something that waxes and wanes. We tend to think about ethics when we, again, crises make us move, right? We're humans. When we have a crisis, we move. And I think what we ought to do is have a steady drumbeat throughout an officer's development and throughout staff NCO development of what ethical leadership means and what ethical decision making entails. Because it's not easy, and in a lot of cases it's not natural. Because it tends to be the harder path. I, I heard a great speech once say, humans are like water. We find the easiest path to solve the hardest problems. So we can cut rock, we can erode mountains, we can put out fires, but we always look for the easiest path because that is the natural human tendency. And when we talk about ethical leadership and ethical decision making, it's not always about choosing the easiest path. And that requires that we actually exercise that thinking, that we have debates like this one, that we expose senior leaders to hard questions, not in crisis, but when they, can, when they have the time to think about it, so that when they're faced with a crisis, they make the right choice. And that's, that's just a hard path. And so I'm, I'm encouraged by groups like this one. And every academy has a center for ethical leadership, and all of our war colleges talk about ethical leadership. But it's a path, it's a journey that's never over. When I, when I hang this uniform up at the end of whenever my career ends, that's not the end of making ethical decisions. It's just another step along the way. When I became a flag officer, I didn't stop having responsibility for what people in the field do. And, and so we can never, ever walk away from that. But how we educate, though, I mean, you're on to a really, I think, a really poignant issue here. How we educate across the continuum of an officer's career or a staff NCO's career to make sure that we continue to reinforce 
the, the foundation of ethical behavior? That's a really hard question. Yes, ma'am. Where are you from? Sir, I'm from Long Island, New York. Okay. Yeah, great question. So I think we have to invest in understanding the potential for fully autonomous weapons, just like we have to understand, you know, nanotechnologies and and uh, you know biopharmacology and engineering, biogenetics. I think we have to understand all of those. Whether we take the step through that doorway or not is a choice we'll have to make as as Western society and as a group of alliances. And so so it's not that we don't investigate and understand. Because investigating and understanding does several things for us. It gives us knowledge of what an opponent might do. It gives us the capacity to defend if we need to against it. And it also stretches us on our thinking about whether or not, as humanity, we want to take that step. And I think that's the key. You know, autonomous systems and, and biogenetics and engineering have some huge benefits for mankind. There's a, there's a great piece on a... Uh, paraplegic who just got up and walked for the first time in 30 years because we figured out how to augment his legs with robotics and let him walk. 30 years ago, that would have been called a miracle. Now it's just science. So I think what we have to do is figure out how, how might you take that kind of technology the marriage of robotics and the human body and change modern warfare. And if you did, what would it mean? What would it mean to the soldier weapon system? What would it mean to our marine infantrymen? What does it mean to airmen? What does it mean to, to sailors? If you could augment them with robots, and then the question is, do you want to do it? Is that advantage really useful in the battle space? Is there a way to counter it or a way to exploit it? I think we have to understand that in its totality. I, and again, I think we're much closer to the Wright brothers on this than we are to Charles Lindbergh. And we all think we're closer to Chuck Yeager and going to the moon. There's a long distance between the thing we're describing, fully autonomous, independent, I'll call them even self-aware weapon systems, and what's on the battlefield today. And, and we've got to understand what that continuum looks like. Yes, sir. First, John's Armed Services Committee. You're talking about the JROC, really kind of piqued my imagination when you're talking about accepting these type of requirements. Uh, have you rejected anything? Uh, do you have a, a criteria for something else brought to you and say, well, this would not be suitable because of its artificial intelligence capability or how it works? Not yet. Here's a place where the JROC has tied itself in a nice, tight Gordian knot, and that's our commitment to two treaties, Oslo and Ottawa, a convention and a treaty. And they deal with landmines and anti-personnel mines in both cases. And they're about what is, you know, distilled down, you know this better than most people, is they're distilled down to what's the dud rate and the false uh, execution rate of landmines, and does that make them unethical weapons in the battle space? And again, they're only indiscriminate if they're used indiscriminately. I have to make that statement pretty loud. Weapons are only indiscriminate if they're used indiscriminately. So if you use landmines to canalize an enemy's armor formation so that you can dispense with them on the battlefield, that's not an indiscriminate use of the technology. If you then abandon them and leave them behind and go about your merry way, having defeated your enemy, you have now left indiscriminate munitions on the battle space. Because people will find them. They will be intrigued by them. They will pick them up, and the, the munition will likely take a life or maim a human. And because you made the choice to leave them behind, 
you've made an unethical choice in the battle space. And so how do we deal with that? We actually map where we put mines. We keep records of where we put a minefield. And when we're done with them, we go clean them up. Not every adversary uses them the same way. So as a consequence of indiscriminate behavior across a large swath of history, the world has rebelled against mines and said they don't have utility in the modern battlefield. You have other ways to dispense with the enemy. And therefore, we will back away from them as tools of modern warfare. I'm not sure that's the best choice in the world. But the question is, how do you use them? So we've tied ourselves in a knot over advanced mines, advanced anti-personnel and anti-armor area denial weapons, and we have taken some off the table because they don't have, they don't meet the criteria that are outlined in those two treaties, even though we haven't signed up to either one. We have agreed to at least follow the general guidelines. And those are two examples of places where we have said no. Thank you. Somebody's pointing over here, yes, sir. Joe, um, you were talking about uh, preemption. I, I started to wonder when uh, the machines are going to start telling us what to do, not just be <coughs> autonomous, but we're probably still a, a ways away from this, but when is the uh, vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs going to be an algorithm? Uh, and uh, and, and, and it, it seems to me that in some ways the military profession might be at the edge of a discussion which is not just ethical, but which is sort of ontological. Mm -hmm. uh, if machines are getting so much better at the things that we do than we are, what are people for? Yeah, and, so. and, and how do they... There's still the purpose of the, of the conflict, I guess, that we're fighting, but it, it seems that we're being, we're being pushed back into a position where we're just a, we're just a meat, and uh, uh, the, the shooting's being done by, uh, and even the decision about the shooting, by another very strange intelligence, which, as you say, is unfathomable. Yeah. So I don't see us going that path. I do see us going down the path of machines enabling humans to be better at what we do. And, and, I, and I make that distinction on purpose. Because if you just let the machines fight, you're right. We're, we're just, we're innocent bystanders. And, and war isn't about innocent bystanders, right? War's about national interests and the values of the country that we go to war for freedom and liberty, all that stuff we agree to defend. Uh, and, and so we have to decide where machines bring value and where humans add value. This is, if you, if you think about the intelligence community right now with artificial intelligence and, and big data, if I were an imagery analyst right now, I would be digging a very deep foxhole because our measure of merit across the intelligence community for decades was how many people can you put to the process of analyzing imagery, right? Everything I just told you in, in the prepared part of my comments was about how good digital technologies are at, at, at recognizing and understanding images. So if I was an imagery analyst, man, I'd be digging the deepest foxhole on the planet to protect myself against the invasion of the machines. Unless, unless I said the following. If they can help me look at the mountains of data I cannot access, and tipping cue me to understanding things that today I don't even look at, would I let the machines into my life? Would I let the machines into my analytical backdrop? 90% of all the digital imagery that exists on the planet is irrelevant to humans. If you don't believe me, look at your last family photograph. Think about it. You've looked at it. I know you've looked at it recently. I have one on my desk. It's my wife and I and our two dogs. What's in the background? What's the reflection in the window behind the photograph? 
Do you care? Do you even notice it? Do you even look at it? Does it even attract your attention? I happen to know the picture of my wife and I was taken in our living room, which doubles as a library, which means there are about 500 books on the bookshelves behind us. What are the titles of the books? Are, are they arranged alphabetically or just color-coded? Or what pattern did we use to put them on the bookshelves? What sculptures are on the bookshelves? I happen to know there's one wooden bird that I carved. It's about that big. It's a small blue jay. What else is on the bookshelves? I have no freaking idea. I know the blue jay's there because I put it there. I made it with my own hand. I have no idea what's on the rest of the bookshelves. That's one image. And the only thing I care about in that image when I look at it is my wife and I and our two dogs. But there's a wealth of information in the image. Imagine that being a panchromatic view of an entire city. We can do that today. How many analysts would it take to look at every pixel in that image. There's actually a piece of work that says by 2020, in order to analyze all the digital imagery that will exist in the world, we'll need 20 million new image analysts. Hey, I'm feeling pretty good about myself now. I can climb out of my foxhole. There's only about 100,000 of us in the whole world. You need 20 million? I'm employed. But if I'm going to look at all of that data and make sense of the patterns and tip in cue to the things that are important in the image, the reflection in the window, the inventory of books, the sculptures on the bookshelves that might be important, I'm going to need some help. And so I think that puts humans back in the game in a very interesting and intriguing way. And the same is true of every place where we apply machines to human interaction. There is a place for humans to add value. The same is true in warfare. The same is true in warfare. And we've got to figure it out. So that's my challenge back on that. I haven't thought about it, though, very much. Yes, sir. Thanks. Uh, you mentioned the, the Terminator conundrum or the Terminator problem. and. Um, when you gave us that scenario, I think a lot of us are uncomfortable about a, an autonomous weapon coming in here and, and killing one of us. Um, I said killing me, just, no, killing just for the record. <laughs> well, then one of us may be particularly uncomfortable about that. Yeah. Um, but if you ask, and, and when we're asked to imagine that kind of scenario, a lot of people seem uncomfortable. And you might think it's because of some practical problems, like what if they make mistakes, or what if they destabilize the international order, or something like that. But even, even supposing we get rid of those, even supposing we can solve those kinds of practical problems, I still think there's a, there's a pretty widespread um, revulsion or fear or discomfort. Uh, but it remains pretty nebulous, and it's been very hard for academics and, and moral philosophers to identify and concretize what that feeling is about. I wonder if you have any thoughts about that, if, if you're sympathetic to the idea that there might be something wrong in itself with delegating that task of killing to a machine. I, I no, it's personal opinion, not the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, right? I don't do this often. I think there is something fundamentally wrong with delegating completely to machines the taking of human life. I, I firmly believe that that, is a f that would be a fundamental error in, in our path, the path of humanity. Fundamental error. Particularly if you make the machines self-aware to the degree that's possible. And they are making decisions absent any human intervention. And by the way, simply turning on and off the on-off switch, that, that's, that's sort of, you know, I, I, I yield to that on mines and a couple other things. But, they, but it, this is about they don't get there by themselves. If you turn the on-off switch on and you have no way to turn it off, and you turn the machine loose into humanity and say, go do whatever it is you think is right. Here's what a legitimate target looks like. Go kill any, anything that you think is a legitimate target and have a nice life and come tell me when you're finished. That, that's fundamentally bad for humanity, right? And that's why I call it a Terminator conundrum, right? If you, if you 
not that I'm big into science fiction, but if, if you follow that novel, it's about killing the human that can change the path of human history. And what the Terminators do is they go hunt him. And they kill all the humans that get in the way. Completely autonomous, uncontrolled, they go do that. And I, and I deliberately chose those words answering a question about a year ago. And I think they still fit. So I think there is something fundamentally wrong with doing that. At, at a, ethically, it's bad for humanity. Now, how do I fix it? How do I prevent it? How, all I can do is say we got to be ready to defend against it, to your question. We have to understand how people might try it. We have to accept that that capability is probably decades into the future. And we need to think about what the path looks like. Yeah. But other people are going to try it. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Chris? You, uh, you opened your remarks by talking about uh, our, our job as a military being to visit violence on people. But arguably, there are, there are a fair number of things that today's military does, and even more than tomorrow's military could do, that are a, a fair distance removed from that. So I wonder what you think the lines look like between military That's a great question. I think there are parallel paths. There, are, there, are, there is a stream of thinking that says we should all be good people, and therefore the military ought to be about you know, spreading goodness around the world and helping stabilize governments and teaching police forces how to be police forces and, and prime ministers how to be prime ministers and presidents how to be presidents. That is not what we do well. And it's really not the fundamental thing we're trained to do. The fundamental thing we're trained to do is take all the tools that allow us to move force around the world and be prepared, if called upon, to witness unspeakable violence on the enemy. And if we compromise on that, we can be good at everything else and fail the nation. So we have to be really careful that the military doesn't become the utility infielder for our government. We're not the utility infielder. We're the pitcher and the catcher. And that's what we have to do well. And, it, and if, we, if we move into other fields, and you know I spent most of my life as an airlifter and a logistician, right? So I've done more humanitarian relief than I've actually done killing people and breaking things. That's what I was specifically trained to do. As a senior officer in the, in the air mobility world, I was trained to be a humanitarian assistance and disaster relief specialist. That doesn't mean I don't know how to make logistics work to impose force on an enemy. And I didn't get so good at being a humanitarian assistance and disaster relief expert that I was incapable of doing the fundamental job for which I was trained. And I think we have to be careful as, as the military not to allow ourselves to become a tool for too many things to too many people at the expense of being good at what we're supposed to do, which is defending the nation. It's a, it's a great question, and I don't feel passionately about it at all. Yes, sir. More calls again. It goes back to civil military relations, this idea that to provide best military advice to civilian leaders, how do you influence the ethical decision making from civilian leaders that you provide their advice to? If they want to do something that you think is either important for a task or mission or against their own values and ethics. Right. So you have to be as convincing as you can possibly be. However, the law says the chairman and I must provide best military advice. The, it obliges the Joint Chiefs through the Chairman to provide their best military advice to the Secretary and the President of the United States. There is nowhere in the Constitution that says they are required to accept it. There's no law that says they're required to accept it. And so what we have to do is be as convincing as possible. I, I am one that says if you come to the table with emotion, you will get overridden. If you come to the table with facts, they are very hard to refute. It doesn't mean you're going to get the decision you want, but it means you argue it passionately and with facts, but bereft of emotion, because emotion won't win. Yes, sir. Yeah, Michael Gross, uh, University of Haifa in Israel. I want to push you a little bit in the opposite Hello. direction. Thank you. From high tech to low tech, many of the weapon systems 
that we've been discussing in the last hour or so have considerable financial and operational constraints. They're very expensive. And even operationally, the example you gave at the very beginning of your talk uh, spoke to the ability to, to, to locate tanks uh, in certain battle space when, in fact, today many of our adversaries don't have tanks. So I'm wondering if we can, or how much attention is paid to some of the more low-tech items of future conflict, and specifically something like propaganda. Because we can look at outfits like ISIS that take a perpetrate a horrific event and publicize it, both of demoralizing both troops and civilians. If you look at the abilities of governments and non-state actors to fabricate and make news, manipulate the media, and then we wring our hands and we say, we can't do that, we can't fight that way. But it's enormously effective from their end, and there's a certain level of our inability to fight on the same plane. Yeah. So how much attention is given to these sorts of problems? That's a wonderful question in time. So uh, on the 4th of April, we saw sarin gas used in Syria. And uh, if you remember what happened quickly thereafter, there was a discussion about whether or not sarin gas had been used. And, and the propaganda machines of both Syria and Russia started into, you know, sort of full swing. It was a horrible accident. You know, it was a... It was a weapons cache that, uh, that uh, the rebels had that they hit, which was fascinating, right? Also completely fabricated. So if you just look at the open source media for the attack on that village in Syria that morning, you'll see two images that you ought to spend a little bit of time on. One is three clearly white vapor airbursts about 10 meters above the ground in a fairly tight pattern. The next image is three craters in the asphalt less than the size of that table. What do those tell you? One, an air dispersed vapor. Two, impact craters, not explosive craters. So the airplane that fired those three pieces of ordnance into that village fired a chemical on rockets that impacted the ground after they dispersed the chemical. Then you see the video of children convulsing with dilated pupils. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to put one, two, and three together and come up with six. And people started calling it, it's, it's only circumstantial. By the way, there were no secondaries. There were no secondaries. If you hit an ammo dump with a bomb, things blow up. Where was the building that was leveled by the explosion that was the weapons cache of the rebels that was struck by the Syrians? It doesn't exist. It wasn't there. All of what I just told you is completely open source. I saw the images on BBC. I concluded that it was a chemical attack without any science. And so when I did the initial briefing to the Secretary of Defense on what I thought had happened, I showed him those images. We can fight this fight if we want to. This is a place where, this is going to sound crazy, big data matters. If we had been out scouring the internet for open source data on what happened in Syria at those geocords that day, everything I just described is available. And so the way you fight propaganda is with fact. We don't have to get in an information fight where we don't tell the truth. We just have to be willing to tell the truth and use it to good effect. It isn't, you're right, about just finding tanks in a dust storm. It's about understanding intent, inferring intent, and moving forward with that in the information space and in the kinetic space at the same time. You're exactly right. But we can use this technology to do that. I'm going to take two more minutes. I know I'm over time. 
Nobody asked me about the coffee. I'm going to tell you a quick story. In November of 1962, a two-year-old took control of an Air Force airplane in a way that was rather unexpected. This two-year-old happened to be sitting over the right wing of a C-47 at 9,000 feet. The airplane had a handle that would allow you to open the window so that our Army paratroopers during World War II could actually stick guns out and shoot at Nazi fighters. Well, this two-year-old reached down and turned the handle and opened the window. The two-year-old was being held into his seat by a man-sized seatbelt, but wasn't a man-sized two-year-old. So the prop wash from the number two engine was actually pulling him out of the airplane. Second lieutenant co-pilot happened to be on his way to the back of the airplane to grab a cup of coffee, saw what was happening, literally threw himself between the window and the young boy, pulled the young boy back into his seat, pulled the window back into place at some personal risk, closed it, turned the handle, pointed at the young boy and said, do not touch that again. And then he went about his business. He walked back to the back of the airplane, got his coffee, went up to the front, probably explained to the aircraft commander what the ruckus was about because the young boy's mother was sitting next to him. And she was more than a little displeased at what had just happened. They landed about 20 minutes later. The lieutenant took the young boy out of his mother's arms and walked him around the airplane. Showed him every rivet, nut, bolt, safety wire, safety pin, and then handed him to his father. I was the little boy. My father loves telling that story because he says the lieutenant was a hero twice that day. Once for closing the window, and second for having the presence of mind to take me out of my mother's arms because when she got feet on the ground, she was going to beat me to within an inch of my life. <laughs> Why do I choose this time and this place to tell this story? It's for every midshipman in the room. I am absolutely convinced that inside of you lives that lieutenant. He never asked for a thank you. He never asked for any acknowledgment. To this day, I do not know his name. I tell the story a lot. I have had people come up to me and say, I've heard that story and not from you. And I've zeroed in on where he retired, Hayward, California. And someday, I might get a chance to meet him, although he's probably a little older than I think. I tell you this story because when it's your turn, when you're faced with that kind of a challenge, to take a life or save a life or give your life to save a life, I am very confident that based on your training and your personal values, you will do the right thing. It's hardwired into all of us. It's why we choose to wear the cloth of a nation. It's why we choose to serve. Because it's not about us. It's about everybody around us. You don't take an oath to defend freedom and liberty if you're not willing to actually take action to make it true. And on that day, that lieutenant put his life on the line to save mine. And I'm supremely confident you will do the same when it's your turn. Thank you all very much. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've got a small coat in my So I'm going to give the general here the Stockdale Moral Compass. It's a compass with an inscription of the Stockdale Center. Uh, there are compasses that guide us as to where we're supposed to go day to day from point to point, but this one is about the moral piece. And on a personal note, I have a very close Marine Corps friend who assisted this general and also the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and he's always told me that two of the finest ethical leaders he has ever met was General Selva and General Dunford. And I think our armed forces, as you could tell from this morning, are in very good hands. So, sir, sir, sir thank you again for thank you taking the much. time. Thank God you. God bless you. Thanks. Good luck, everybody.